And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And the evening and the morning were the first day. God is good. And all the time. Let's try it again. God is good. And all the time. Oh, you say God is best. Ah, I just picked that up. I was wondering what you were saying. Okay, well, let's try it again now. For my sake, God is good. And all the time. That is theologically accurate. Okay. How are you? How was your day? Did you pray? How many times? <laughs> once? How many people prayed once? Just once. Only once. All right. You don't need God. Okay. Uh, who prayed twice? <laughs> How about three times? Four? Five? All right. Well, it's nice to see you. Whether you prayed once or you didn't pray at all, a merciful God has preserved your lives. Can you say amen? amen. And, you know, God is a good God. He really, he's the best, as you say. If God were to give us what we deserve, this world would be a vast cemetery. Everyone would be dead. But God, the Bible says in Psalm 103, verse 10, He hath not dealt with us after our sins nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. In other words, God does not give us what we deserve because he does not like to punish. What does he love to do? Bless. God loves to bless. God punishes only so much as is necessary to satisfy justice, but he blesses us all out of proportion. I love God May I see those of you who love God, can I see your hands? And those of you online, I believe you're raising your hands or your hearts. I welcome you to this blessed place. The presence of God is with us, and we thank him for the presence of his spirit. I welcome those of you online, particularly those who are not Seventh-day Adventists. It is a high, high honor to have you with us. And may the Lord superabundantly bless your lives in every possible way. I welcome the little boys and the little girls who are watching. I am always delighted to see little children in church, and I love to see men in church. Ladies, don't get jealous, but I love to see men in church. Some men think they're too tough to be in church. Jesus was the toughest man who ever lived. Are you following me? He was the toughest man who ever lived. Why? He always did that which was right. For those of you in this building, you are not Seventh-day Adventists, but you are here for the very first time. May I see your hand? First time. You're not a Seventh-day Adventist. Ah, okay. okay. All right. Okay. This is, and this is heartening. Those of you who are not Seventh-day Adventists, you've been coming and coming and coming. May I see your hand? You've been coming and coming and coming. Okay. Well, may the Lord shower his blessings upon you. And I pray the same for those of you online. Let me pray for our guests. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Father in heaven, you are personal God. First, you made Adam first, then made Eve. And when you made Eve, Adam was in a deep sleep. You deal with us first, individually. Bless every guest, individually. Design your blessing to their needs, their God. But more than that, Design your blessings to your desire and will for their lives. Because ultimately, they will be happy. Give them a consciousness of your love for them. Protect them from the enemies they God. Surround their homes with the special forces from heaven. And grant them a place in your kingdom when you come. In Jesus' name, amen. Let me answer. I'll answer one question separately. I'll answer two more in the sermon. Is that okay? All right, let me 
get to this question, which I'm not sure I understand, but uh, I'll try. Make sure the sound is down. Uh, where are we? Here are we. Mm -hmm. All right. Let me pray. Holy Father, give me wisdom. Please. I do not want to mislead anyone. Give me wisdom as promised in your word, James 1.5. I receive it with whatever faith I have. In Jesus' name, amen. In Nigeria, there are some instances where a woman is said to be having, sleeping with another man in the spirit world. Never heard of that, but I guess it happens some places. Or a man is said to be married to a woman, in this, uh, to a spiritual woman. One woman is said to have been in such a situation, have been prayed for several times, but it seems the problem is still there. What do you have to say about that? Turn this phone off before I forget. I've got the question. If this is a reality, it is not of God. Are you with me? It is not of God. Now, there is indeed a spiritual world. It is populated by the fallen angels. It is also populated by the holy angels. They're both spirit beings. And where there are spirit beings, there's a spiritual world. Two human beings cannot have physical relations in a spiritual world. Are you following me? One man can imagine something in his head because the Bible says sin begins here. Not in the body, it begins here. He can imagine something, she can imagine something. Now someone may be bothered by a demon in very strange ways. But as far as physical relations in the spiritual world, I'm not sure what to say about that. All I can say is this. That person or persons ought to recommit the life to God one hundred percent because the life committed to god is protected by god can you say amen that person ought to claim the promise of first john chapter 3 verse 4 which says this he that committeth sin is of the devil for the devil sinneth from the beginning for this purpose the son of god was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil that person recommit the life entirely to God. Most of us don't do that. We commit 99% and we leave 1% to Satan. And that's all he needs to destroy your life. 1%. Then the person must claim 1 John 3, 8. Also Luke 10, 19. Behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. Let me say that again. Behold, I give you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. That's what that person needs. A total recommitment to God and a claiming of 1 John 3, 8. That Christ would destroy whatever Satan is doing in the person's life. I believe I told you this story in the first week. I was preaching somewhere and a young lady came to me for counseling. She said, uh, demons come at night and physically abuse me. That's what she said. Physical relations. She said it happens all the time. I told her, confess all your sins. How many? All. All. All Satan needs to have a hold in a life is one unconfessed sin that you know about. Confess all your sins. At night, go to bed thinking and claiming and praying about 1 John 3, 8, which ends by saying, for this purpose the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Go to bed, I said to her, praying that prayer, claiming that promise. She came back the next day. She said, I slept peacefully, unmolested, for the first time in months. The devil cannot overcome God's word. We'll say amen for God's word. 
It's your protection. You see, angels were created by God's word. Psalm 148 verse 5, For he commanded and they were created. Angels were created by the word of God. The thing that creates you is more powerful than you. Am I talking to myself? The thing that creates you is more powerful than you. If the word created angels and Lucifer, it, it, uh, Satan, was a holy angel, now a fallen angel, it does not change the fact he was created by the word of God and the word of God still has power over him. And so the Bible says in Matthew 8, 16, and when the even was come, they brought unto him all many that were possessed with devils and he cast out the spirits with his word. If what I read in the question is your problem, give your life to God. How? 100%. If you don't do that, the devil will eventually dominate your life. If it is not given entirely to God. Claim the word of God, the promises, 1 John 3, 8, Luke 10, 19, and God will deliver you. Can you say amen? All right. Our subject for this evening, bits and pieces. What did I say? And this was the first bit. Now I get to the other bits and the other pieces in the body of the message. As always, if you're not using one of these things, I ask politely that you turn them off. If you're using them, turn down the sound, please. You have been very faithful, I believe, in that respect. Thank you for your cooperation. Favor number two, while I'm speaking, pray for me and say, God, Lord, put your words in that man's mouth. Jeremiah 1 verse 9, then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said unto me, behold, I have put my words in thy mouth. I also want God to do for me what he did for Moses in Exodus 4 verse 12, where God said to Moses, now, therefore, go, and I will be with thy mouth and teach thee what thou shalt say. I want God to do for me what David talks about in Second Samuel 23, verse 2. The Spirit of the Lord spake by me, and his word was in my tongue. And favor number three, think. Isaiah 1, 18, come now, let us do what? Reason together saith the Lord. Let's pray. Loving Father in heaven, we come to you as we've come before seeking your help, seeking your mercy as expressed in your forgiveness. Micah 7 verse 18 says, Who is a God like unto thee that pardoneth iniquity? The way and the degree to which you pardon astonishes the universe. We want that pardon now if we have offended you. Father, I recommit my life to you now 100%. That you may use me effectively in this desk, dear God. So that those who are still wrestling with truth may finally surrender to the God of life. The God of blessing. The God of salvation. The God who conquers Satan. Tell me what to say, how, when. And Father, help me to speak boldly but also with compassion. Bless those who are listening. Give a special blessing to our guests, dear God, and a sweet blessing to the little boys and little girls. Wherever this message is heard around the world, unleash your spirit to bless the listeners. Now, God, let mighty angels surround this place to keep back the demons because demons exist. Not only where we are, but wherever people are listening, surround them with your mighty angels, dear God. And let them understand, believe, or be reminded that with God, nothing shall be impossible. Bless this country, Father. From the president down to whoever occupies the lowest administrative position, bless. Bless the vice chancellor of this university. Give him and his officers the wisdom they need to produce graduates that will bless Nigeria and bless the world. Thank you for life. Thank you for the honor of speaking for you. Thank you for the presence of his majesty the king and her majesty the queen. We thank you for them. Bless them, I pray, please. And bless the royal family. In Jesus' name, let God's people say, 
Amen and amen. Go with me to Leviticus, not Leviticus, um, 1 Timothy chapter 4. 1 Timothy chapter 4. Now, let me tell you, this is not the message I intended to deliver. Because I told you last night I delivered a particular message. But as I was in the counseling session, the Spirit redirected my mind. And that's one reason I love one-to-one -one counseling. I, I, I learn what I ought to talk about sometimes, what people are struggling with. As opposed to just theology. Are you with me? And so I believe God's Spirit redirected my mind. It's 20 minutes to 5. What book did I say? First Timothy. What chapter? Four. What verse? Beginning at one. When you found it, let me know. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly, that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to the seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry, and commanding to abstain from meats. Read with me now. Which God hath created, come on, to be with thanksgiving of them that and know the truth. Next verse. For every creature of God is and nothing to be re if it be received with thanksgiving. Now, there are people who use for every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused as an excuse. To eat anything. How do I always ask you to read the Bible? Come on, tell me. Micros, let's read from verse 3 again. Are you there? What does it say? Read for me. What does that say? Forbidding to marry, we leave that alone, and commanding to abstain from meats, carefully now, microscopically, which God hath created, uh huh, to be received with by whom? Ah, Paul is not talking to the whole world. Whom is he addressing? Those who believe, come on, and know the truth. Now, is that the whole world, yes or no? Come on, answer me. Is that the whole world? Does the whole world believe? Does the whole world know the truth? No, I have shown you from the Bible, Revelation 12 verse 9, just listen. And the great dragon was cast out. That old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. If most of the world is deceived, most of the world does not believe, and most of the world does not know the truth. Reason. 1 John 5.19 And we know that we are of God, and the whole world lieth in wickedness. Here again, we have the whole world, meaning most of the world by far. If most of the world lies in wickedness, most of the world does not believe. Now, is that reasoning clear? You didn't answer me. Mm. You can't believe God and be wicked. You can't follow the truth and be wicked. So if most of the world is wicked, if most of the world is deceived, most of the world does not believe, even though most of, most of the world may go to church. Most of the world does not believe, and so we go back. Which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them that believe. And know the truth. God is writing to believers. Then, he says, for every creature of God is good. Meaning every creature which God created for the believers. Verse 5. Is explained by which verse? Come on. Verse 5 is explained by which verse? Verse 4. Which God has created to be received with thanksgiving of them that believe and know the truth. Now God has provided certain foods for them that believe and know the truth. Verse 5, all Paul is saying is all those that God has provided for those who believe, all of them are good for food. He did not mean slugs and lizards, and bats, and scorpions. Are you with me? Are you with me? If you, if you jump on 1 Timothy 4 verse 5, for every creature of God is good, just because you want to eat a pig, then you must tell me it's good to eat scorpions, and bats, and slugs. 
Every creature refers to all the creatures God created for his believing people. If that's clear, say amen. Let the Bible strengthen that point better than I can. Now, go to Leviticus 11. We'll read from verse 1. And I want to point something out to you. I cannot tell you enough the value of reading the Bible how? Microscopically. Do you have Leviticus 1? From verse 1, let me slow down since you didn't tell me. God bless my sister who is doing a good job. Remember to pray for her as you pray for me. We are united in the same work. Can you say amen? All right. And the Lord spake unto Moses and to Aaron, saying unto them, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying what? These are the beasts which ye shall eat among all the beasts that are in the earth. These are the ones you can eat. To whom is God speaking the whole world or the israelites the israelites in other words those who believe and know the truth he gave them on mount sinai now next verse uh, verse 3 says of whatsoever part of the hoof and is cloven footed and chewed the cud among the beasts that shall he eat god says you can eat a cow an antelope a deer, a, a moose, a goat, sheep, ox, fine. They part the hoof, they chew the cud. Is that right? Is that, is, is that what you read? Now, does that exclude scorpions? Yes. <laughs> does that exclude bats? Yes. So every creature is not good for food. I told you before, when studying the Bible, don't begin at the end. Begin where? As close to the beginning as you can. Before we go any further in Leviticus, go to Genesis 7. Genesis 7. People like to say the laws of diet in the Bible are for Jews. People do anything to get away from obeying God. I mean anything and they say anything. Father in heaven, continue to be with me, please. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. And the Lord said unto Noah, Genesis 7 verse 1, Come thou and all thy house into the ark, for thee have I seen righteous before me in this generation. Now read verse 2 with me. What is he saying? Of every clean beast thou shalt take to thee by sevens the male and his female. And of beasts that are not clean, by two, the male and his female. Of fowls also of the air, by two, come on, the male and the female. Stop. Do you observe something in that verse? Verse 2. We have clean, come on, and unclean. Now, were there any Jews in the days of Noah? No. This is before the flood. You do not need to be, have a PhD in Old Testament theology to see before the flood, God separated animals from clean, from unclean. You can eat clean, not unclean. God did that hundreds of years before there was one Jew. Before there were any Israelites. God told Moses, take more clean into the ark than unclean. I want you to see. That the concept of clean and unclean foods did not begin in the wilderness with Moses. People call that Moses' law. It is not the law of Moses. It is the law of God. And before the flood destroyed this earth, God had differentiated between clean and unclean. Hundreds of years later now, we are in Leviticus chapter 11. And God says, animals that are cloven-footed and chew the cud, you can eat that. Now, let's read verse 4 of Leviticus 11. Tell me if that's on the board. Is it there? What does that say? Nevertheless, these shall ye not eat of them that chew the cud or of them that divide the hoof as the camel. Because he cheweth the cud, come on, but divideth not the hoof. Finish that sentence. He is unclean to the world. <laughs> ah, thanks for the correction. God bless whoever it was. He is unclean to the world. 
He's unclean to whom? To you. Why? You're my people. They can eat whatever they want. Not my people. I'm talking to myself. He's unclean to you. Go to verse 5. And the corny. Because he cheereth the cud, but divideth not the hoof, he is unclean to you. Verse 6. And the hare. Because he, come on, read with me. He cheereth the cud, but divideth not the hoof, he's unclean to you. And the swine. Give me a shorter word for swine. The pig. I have nothing against pigs. I just choose to obey God. Can you say amen? And the swine, though he, what? Divine the hoof and be cloven-footed, yet he cheweth not the cud. He is unclean to you. Read verse 8 of their flesh. Shall ye not eat? Under the carcass, shall ye not touch? Finish the verse. They are unclean. How many times between verse 4 and verse 8 you see unclean to you? Count. Well, they may have to run the verses on the... Uh, well, I'll tell you five. Verse 4, unclean to you. Verse 5, unclean to you. Verse 6, unclean to you. Verse 7, unclean to you. Verse 8, unclean to you. If you're God's child. If you're not, do whatever you want. You can eat the snake raw or cook it. Do whatever you want. Do you understand what the Bible is saying? There is a difference between what God expects of his people and what he expects of the rest of the world. Go to Genesis 17. Our subject is bits and pieces. The first bit was physical relations between men and women in the spiritual world. This bit is what we eat what is clean, what is not unclean, or what is unclean. That's the second bit. We have another bit to go. What book did I say? Genesis 17. In this chapter, God gave to Abraham circumcision. He did not give it to the rest of the world. Let's read from verse 10 of Genesis 17. When you have that, say amen. Read with me. This is my covenant, which you shall keep between me and you and thy seed after thee. Finish the verse. Every man shall among you shall be circumcised. And ye shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskin, and it shall be for a token between me, betwixt me and you. It's a sign between God and his people, not God and the world. Please tell me you're following me. Read verse 11 again out loud. And ye shall circumcise, come on, the flesh of your foreskin, and it shall be a, of the covenant betwixt God and the Israelites. Now, read verse 12. And he that is, it is all shall be circumcised among you, every man shall in your generation, he that is born in the house, or bought with money of any stranger, which is not of thy seed. In other words, if a non-Israelite wants to join you, then what happens? He is circumcised. If a non-Israelite wants to join you, then he has to stop eating certain things. Are you with me? Go to Leviticus 11 again. Not, yes, live 11, uh, no, not Leviticus 11, Leviticus 20, we read verse 26. Some things have to be said over and over because the carnal nature, when truth is preached, the carnal nature is opposing it, opposing it, opposing, opposing, trying to confuse simple truth. Do you have Leviticus 20? We read verse 26. For thou art what? Unholy people unto the Lord thy God. The Lord thy God hath what? Is holy. The Lord thy God hath chosen thee. He hath severed thee from all other people that ye should be mine. Now, what does sever mean? He is holy. And he hath severed you from other people that you should be his. What does sever mean? Cut off. Separate. 
For thou art an holy people and the Lord thy God. The Lord thy God is holy and have se severed you, cut you off. Don't do what they do. Because now you are mine in a very personal way. Now, the Bible says, for God so loved the world. Yes, that never changes. But God is looking for people who will obey him everything he says. I've separated you from other people that you should be mine. In other words, to be God's, you have to be separated. Go to uh, Deuteronomy 18 quickly. Deuteronomy chapter 18, we read from verse 9. Our subject, bits and pieces, we're looking at diet and separation of clean from unclean, whether dietary or morally. What book did I say? Deuteronomy, what chapter? 18, what verse 9? When it's up there, tell me. When thou art come into the land, which the Lord thy God giveth thee, thou shalt not learn to do after the abominations of those nations. We have two groups of people in that verse. Identify them. Thou Meaning whom? The Israelites. Who is the other group? Those nations. Two groups. Essentially, God's people and the rest of the world. Let me say it again. God's people and the rest of the world. When thou art come into the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, thou, my people, shalt not learn to do after the abominations of those nations. Verse 10, there shall not be found among you any that maketh his son or his daughter to pass through the fire. What do you call that? Human sacrifice. Some of the other nations did that. And there's some evidence at some point the Israelites also did it because they copied other nations. There shall not be found of you anyone that maketh his son or his daughter the pass of the fire or that useth divination or an observer of times or an enchanter or a witch or consulted with familiar spirits or a wizard or a necromancer or charmer a wizard necromancer for all that do these things are an abomination unto the lord for because of these abominations the lord doth god doth drive them out from before you now pause catch this all those nations mentioned in verse 9 where god says thou shalt not learn to do after the abominations they all had their religions They all had their religions, but their practices were contrary to the God of heaven and earth. The fact that you belong to a religion does not place you in God's favor. The people who said crucify him had a religion. And Jesus had to start with the apostles, his own. Are you with me? These things, and so God tells the Israelites, don't carry out the religious practices those people do. And the punishment for that was death. What am I trying to tell you? You must understand, when God calls you, he calls you to be separate, to be different, to be unlike the rest of the world. That's why he can tell the disciples, ye are the light of the world. What is he saying about the world? Quickly. The world is in darkness. Ye are the light of the world. You can't be light if you're living like darkness. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel but on a candlestick. And it giveth light. To give light, you must give this. This, the entrance of thy word, giveth light. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Revelation 19.13 says the name of Christ is the word of God. The word is light. The word is life. The word is Christ. When we come to God, we are to be different in thinking, in diet, in dress, in recreation, in every single area. In family, in romance, in money management, in health, in everything. Why? So that the world can say, who are these people? I want to be like them. They're healthy. They're not in debt. The children do well, but don't take exams on Sabbath. The homes are not broken. Who are these people? Who are unlike the rest of the world? Are you following me? 
All right. There are clean foods and unclean foods. First Timothy 4, verse 4 does not mean every single animal is good for food. It means all those create, uh, verse 5, sorry, does not mean every created being is good for food. It means those referred to in verse 4 created for those that believe and know the truth. If you believe God and know the truth, there's certain things you simply do not eat or drink or wear or say or watch or buy. If that's clear, say amen. All right. Ooh, it's already two minutes to five. Let me pray again. Loving Father in heaven, as I move to the other it, bit or piece, move with me and guide me. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I'll ask you a question. Don't answer me. Some of you want to be baptized. You're afraid of what your parents will say. Don't answer me. You're afraid of your uncle, your father, your mother, your aunt, your friends, your colleagues, those from the old church which you want to leave and come to truth. You are afraid. Let's go to Luke chapter 2. I want to give you courage to obey God. Luke chapter 2. We read from verse 46. Mary and Joseph and Jesus went to Jerusalem for a feast. On the way back, Joseph and Mary lost track of Jesus. They looked for him for three days before they found him. They, had, they probably thought he was with other relatives, as children tend to do. Verse 46, Luke 2. And it came to pass that after three days, they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the doctors, both hearing them and asking them questions. And all that heard him were astonished at his understanding and answered. But when they saw him, they were amazed. And his mother said unto him, Son, why hast thou thus dealt with us? Thy father and I have sought thee how sorry. Notice the question, why have you done that to us? If you fail your exams and the whole village finds out, your parents will say to you, why did you do that to us when all other children passed? If you go to jail for stealing a chicken, your family will say, why did you do this? Because you are embarrassing us. We have to leave the village and move. Mary said to Jesus, what parents say today, what are you doing to us? So when you decide to keep the Sabbath, someone in your family may say, mm -mm -mm -mm, what are you doing to us? Simply because you've decided to follow truth. If you're with me, say amen. Perhaps you've had that experience. Let me tell you about myself. I'm not the center of the message, but I hope you understand. When my mother discovered the Sabbath truth, we were grouped as Catholics. And uh, I used to serve with a priest on the altar as an acolyte. Red shawl and white knife was very, very... It meant everything to me to be serving with a priest. My mother found out about the Sabbath. When she found out, she was immediately convicted and started looking for a church where people worship. On Saturday, she had never in her long life ever heard of such a thing. We found a church, took a cab, drove to the church, never looked back. She was Now, my father sailed as a merchant marine. In other words, not on army ships or military ships, but uh, transport ships carrying wheat and beef, and he'd go to Argentina, then go to Australia, then Belgium, then wherever else he went. So he would be gone for a long time. On one occasion, he left home when I was eight years old. He came back when I was 21. <laughs> That's a long trip. That's all the way through Nigeria. <laughs> 20. He was gone for 13 years. If my sister hears this, she may probably rebuke me for telling the story. So he wasn't around when my mother made that decision. So he got upset because as the man of the house, he had to be informed. But he was somewhere across the world and there was no internet, no Snapchat, no Instagram, no, you complete the list. And so we effectively, mother lost her husband, we lost her father. 
but she was convicted God has spoken to her. And she learned about the Sabbath. When God reveals truth to you, it is not to complicate your life. It's an act of mercy. When he shows you what's truth, it is mercy not to complicate your life. Now you have to say to God, Father, I'm so grateful. I am willing to face the challenges that come with accepting truth. Now, let's go back to Luke chapter 2. Verse 48. And when they saw him, they were amazed. And his mother said unto him, Son, why hast thou thus dealt with us? Thy father and I have sought this sorrowing. Now, read verse 49 and verse 50. And he said unto them, How is it he sought me? Wist ye not that I must be, what? About my father's business. Now, picture this scene. Here's Jesus, 12 years old, as tall as this little thing here. There's his father, that's me. He looks at his father and he says, Father, do you not understand I must be about? Come on, talk to me. My father's business. Which means I have a father that's above you. He's the one who'll send me to hell or heaven. Not you. Now the Bible says, honor thy father and thy mother. Am I right? Yes. Go to Ephesians 6. Ephesians 6. Ephesians 6. We read verse 1. Paul is talking to children. All children listen to Ephesians 6. Remember, if you have a problem, blame the Bible, not me. In other words, blame God, not me. Do you have Ephesians 6? Read with me. What does that say? Children, what? Obey your parents. Finish that for In the Lord. It's right to obey your parents. How? In the Lord. So if your parents says to you, kill your neighbor, that's not in the Lord. What will you say? I can't do that. I, I wish. Are you with me? In the Lord. Which means a child must have the courage to say, Mother, I love you. Father, I love you. But I can't do this. Now, the Bible says the seventh day is the Sabbath. Here's a young man, a young woman, convicted by God. The father says, you can't get baptized. The child must find the courage to say, especially when he's 18, 19, Father, I love you, but I must obey God. If I follow your command not to keep the Sabbath, I am not obeying you in the Lord. Parents, listen to me. If you allow your child to obey God, that child becomes a double blessing in that house. Because then that child is God's special property. Are you following me? And for that child's sake, that house will be blessed. Let me show you what I mean. Go to Genesis chapter 39. You know the story of Pharaoh who was sold by his brothers? Do you know that story? Of course you do. We read from verse, 30, verse 2 of Genesis 39. And Joseph was a prosperous man, and he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. And the Lord was with Joseph, and he was a prosperous man, and he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. Now he's a slave. Verse 3, and his master saw that the Lord was with him, and that the Lord made all that he did to prosper in his hand. Now, the Bible says, verse 2, verse 3, God was with Joseph, which means Joseph was obedient to God, even as a slave. Read verse 5. And it came to pass from the time that he made him overseer in his house and over all that he had. Read with me now. That the Lord did what? Bless the Egyptian's house. Come on. For Joseph's sake. And the blessing of the Lord was upon all that he had where? In the house, come on. And in the field now, all of that was because of Joseph. When you allow your child to obey God, that child becomes a conduit of God's blessings in your house. The Lord blessed it. Now the Egyptian was an unbeliever. Three times we're, called, we're told 
He was an Egyptian because the writer of Genesis, Moses, under the direction of the Spirit of God, wants us to contrast the Egyptian with the Hebrew. Joseph with Potiphar. Even though Potiphar was secularly higher, Joseph was spiritually superior. And because of Joseph, God blessed the Egyptian's house. I don't think you get what I'm trying to say. The Egyptian was not a believer. Yet God blessed him comprehensively. Why? Because of the presence of a child of God in his house. Let me extend that. Wherever you work, if you are a true child of God, the office where you work should be blessed. Finish my words. Because of you. Your village, your neighborhood should be blessed because you live there. Your classroom should be blessed because you're a student in that classroom. The plane you're flying on finish my words, should be blessed. Why? Because you're on it. And you're an obedient child of God, not just a church member. I want parents who are listening to me to understand, if you allow your children to obey God, you have introduced blessings into that home. And for children, I'm going to make a call at the end because I want to pray for those of you who are a little afraid to tell your parents, I'm getting baptized. Let me tell you an incident. I was preaching in a certain country. And this young lady came to me. She was a Muslim. 16, I think. She came to me. She said, I have been convicted by what I've heard. And I'm getting baptized. No matter what. <laughs> no matter what. And she got baptized. I was in the same country on another occasion. During a crusade, this young lady came to me. She said, I'm getting baptized, but my parents have threatened to disinherit me. No tuition, no support, no nothing if I go through with my decision to obey God. I said, what will you do? She says, I'm getting baptized. She got baptized. The parents cut her off for a year. You know what they did in that year? What did they do? They watched her. They watched her. And she remained, give me a word, strong. At the end of that year, they restored everything to her. Come on, say amen. Because they realized they could not turn her around. That her religion meant something to her and had changed her life. God may test you. How much does he want to obey me or she? There is no power on earth that can overthrow you when you make up your mind to obey God. Those of you online, I hope you're listening. Someone will oppose your decision to be baptized and obey all God's Ten Commandments, including the fourth. Some human being will try to come between you and God. You have to decide, Father Though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. This is the attitude you need. Is it easy? No. That's why you need divine power to stiffen your spine so you can stand strong. Now, let's go back to Luke chapter 2. In verse 49, Jesus said, How is it he sought me? Wist ye not that I must be about my father's business? Now, read verse 50 of Luke chapter 2. Do you have it? It's not up there yet. All right, my friends, online, we're waiting for it to come up on our own personal line. Is it there now? Luke 2, 50. Read with me. And they understood not, come on, the saying, come on, which he spake unto them. They did not understand. Who were they? The parents of God. Jesus was God while he was human. Joseph, his earthly father, Mary, his biological mother, they did not understand his position. Your parents may not understand. Go to God. Say, Father, I come with the same problem Jesus had. His parents did not understand. I'm in that position. God, help me. Go to John chapter 7. John 7. 
then I'm going to make a call. I want you to come. No matter how hard, fast your heart is beating with terror, I want you to come. Do you have John 7? Read verse 5. You won't believe this. Are you there? Read with me. For neither did his brethren believe in him. At some point, the family of Christ did not believe in him. Can you imagine you're sleeping on a bed right next to God? <laughs> he had four brothers, <laughs> two sisters. Every night you sleep next to God and you hear God snore and you don't believe him. <laughs> Are you with me? Now, this, the carnal mind just does not like to believe. And the Bible says his family did not believe him. Go to Mark chapter 3. Mark chapter 3. In 20 and 21, you won't believe this. <laughs> in chapter 20, in verse 20 of Mark 3, they're in a house, they're serving. They, had, they were so busy, they had no time to eat. When his friends heard it, they came to do what? Lay hold on him. Finish verse 21. Because they said, he's out of his mind. Jesus was healing the sick, feeding the hungry, clothing the naked. He was so busy. His family said, he is mad. Let us go and stop him. They came, lay hold on him means to arrest him. For they said, he's out of his mind. He is mad. When you accept Christ, the unbeliever will call you. Come on, mad. Didn't one Roman ruler tell Paul he was mad? Yes. Well, let's be mad for Jesus. Can you say amen? Let's be mad for the truth. Ah, my brothers and sisters, God may be calling you to win your entire family. Let me say it again. God may be calling you to win your entire family to the truth. He'll test you. Pass the test. Be courageous. If your parents are preventing you, tell them we want to talk to them. Come right here. If they can't come, we'll come to your house and talk to them. In other words, we'll show God we're willing to do all that we can do before he steps in. Are you following me? Tell them we would like to talk to them on your behalf. If they won't come, we're willing to come to where they are. What's our subject? These are some big pieces. Can you say amen? <laughs> what was our first bit? A woman spiritually connected to a man. That's anti-God, anti-Bible. That life needs to be surrendered completely to God so that Satan's control might be broken. Broken, broken. The second bit, everything that exists isn't good for food. And clean and unclean foods have nothing to do with Jews and Israelites. It has to do with God's choices for his people. By the way, let me comment on clean and unclean foods. Father, I'm ending. Be with me. In a very marked way, in Jesus' name I pray, amen. In Leviticus, you don't have to go there now, but at your convenience, read chapters 11 to about 16, to 16, 11 to 16. There are various forms of uncleanness. Let me give you some examples. The worst was leprosy. There was a ritual to go through to be cleansed of leprosy. And the priest would declare you clean. Mildew on the house was a form of uncleanness. There was a ceremony in Leviticus to purify that house. Mildew on your clothes was a form of uncleanness. There was a ceremony there all in Leviticus 11 to 16 to purify that. Dandruff was a form of uncleanness. There was a ceremony for that. A nocturnal emission, you don't know what that is, ask your doctor, was a form of uncleanness. There was a ceremony for that. If a woman gave birth to a boy or girl, she was unclean. There was a ceremony for that, to cleanse you. There was no ceremony to make an unclean animal clean. I'm 
I'm talking to myself? Okay. There was no ceremony to make an unclean animal clean. I'm doing that because I want to stop a sneeze. <laughs> That's why I keep doing that. My brothers and sisters, listen to me carefully. Remember favor number three. What's that? Tell me quickly. Think. The physiology in the Old Testament. <laughs> Come on, talk to me. What am I about to say? Is the physiology in the new. The anatomy in the old is the anatomy in the new. What caused diabetes in the old will cause diabetes in the new. So health laws aren't Old Testament laws. They are health laws. Because there is Old Testament health and New Testament health. You sneeze in the Old Testament the way you sneeze in the new. Are you with me? Think. So when God said, don't eat this animal, it's not good. It's not good at all. Regardless of the historical era, it's just not good. Because health is not determined by historical periods. Health is health. Sickness is sickness. The leprosy back then is leprosy today. So that bit, the clean foods, unclean foods. The clean foods for God's people. For the unbeliever, you can eat what you like, even though God is not pleased. And then for those of you who are wrestling with my relatives are opposed to my decision, I want you to step out in faith and tell God, Jesus lived in a family that initially did not believe in him. Jesus had parents who could not understand why he was explaining the Bible in the temple. And they thought he was doing something to them. Jesus had brothers who did not believe in him. If Christ can have brothers who did not believe in him for a while, I should say, surely you and I can have relatives who do not believe in what we believe. When God reveals it to us, as, as I told you, I effectively lost a father and my mother, a husband, because she decided to keep the seventh day Sabbath. Listen to me. Salvation is built on, there's a word, it starts with an S, then an A, then a C, then an R, then an I, come on, then an F, sacrifice. Salvation provided is based on sacrifice. To benefit from it requires sacrifice. How many of you will say, Father, thank you for the sacrifice of Calvary. Can I see your hand? Yes. Do you mean that? Do you really mean that? Or did you raise your hand because that's the custom? Hands down. Father, thank you for the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Can I see your hand? Confirm that by standing up. Confirm it by standing. God is a God who confirms. He calls Samuel, Samuel, Moses, Moses, Martha, Martha, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, Paul, Paul. It's 20 after 5. I should be done by 5.30. Question for you. Not for my benefit first, but for God's. Have you understood the message, yes or no? Okay. Do you love God, yes or no? I believe you do. And you want to do what's right. All people have challenges. I am speaking to that young man, that young woman, or any man of any age, any woman. You want to observe God's law, God's Sabbath. You want to accept the truth you've heard. But you have a challenge with respect to family. Before I want you to come. Let me pray for you. You have a challenge with family that's blocking you. Come. You got a challenge with family. Come. Let me pray for you. To the God whose son Jesus had a challenge with family. You want to obey, but you're concerned about family will say, or friends, come, let us pray. Come. There has to be some persons out there facing that challenge. Come. Don't be afraid. Just come. Come right down. Let me pray for you. My prayer has no power. God has the power. The prayer is just a way of connecting with that power. Come. My brother, come right here. 
God bless you. Somebody else, come, 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 come. God bless you, come. I have a challenge with relatives. Come. Come. God bless you. God bless you. I really mean that. God bless you. Someone else, come. I was preaching in a certain country. While I'm talking, you come. A lady accepted the truth and the Sabbath wanted to be baptized. Her husband said, no. She said, I have to follow God. I'm getting baptized. She came to the church that morning, Sabbath morning, to be baptized, and her husband came to physically stop the baptism. The elders intercepted him quickly and said, can we talk to you? Took him into the pastor's office. He left that office agreeing to take Bible studies. Can you say amen? He came to physically stop the baptism of someone whom God had called. And the elders thinking, leaders of the church must always think. They said, can we talk to you? And they prayed with him, spoke to him. He walked out of that office agreeing to get Bible studies. You have a challenge with family members. Come. You want to obey God's commandments, the Holy Sabbath. Come, come, come. You have a challenge. Come. You love your mother, your father. You do not want to disappoint them. Come. Keep in mind, it is God who admits you to his kingdom. God bless your parents. They cannot admit you to the kingdom. Come. Somebody else come. I have a challenge with family. Come. The rest of you should be praying who have no challenge of that kind. I want to be baptized. I want to obey God. Keep his holy seventh day Sabbath. I want to be a part of God's people. I have a challenge with family members. Come. Come. You're afraid? Come. You're nervous? Come. You're coming to God. We'll pray. we let you go. Anybody else? I have a challenge with family members. Come. Come. Anyone else? Come, sister. God bless you. God bless you. I really mean that sincerely. God bless you. God really bless you. Anybody else? Then I'll pray. Anybody else? 60 seconds, then I pray. It's 25 after 5. I have a challenge with, uh, God bless you. God bless my brother. God bless you. It takes a little while, but we do move. Is the spirit talking to you. 60 seconds begin now. Come. I have a family challenge. And that's holding me up. 50 seconds. Come. The rest of you pray for victory 40 seconds my father may be angry my mother my older siblings but I want to do what God wants me to do and Jesus understands come 30 seconds come we'll pray and we'll put the matter in God's hands come 20 seconds somebody else as soon as I pray, follow me to that back room. I talk to you personally, then let you go. Anybody else? I have a challenge with family. I'm afraid. 15 seconds. Come. Come. My husband is opposed. My wife is opposed. My mother, my father, my siblings, they're opposed, and I'm under pressure. I need help. Come. I'm praying. Father. In the name of Jesus Christ, I come before you to present to you men and women who have found themselves in a situation in which Christ found himself. In a family that at some point in his ministry or his life did not believe in him. Even the disciples who followed him did not understand him. Dear God, I present to you these men and women, your sons and your daughters. In the name of Jesus Christ who died for them, who took their human nature, give them the courage, dear God, to stand for you. Give them the strength to obey your commandments. Help them to understand that ultimately it is you who admits them into the kingdom. Yes, they love their friends and family, but let them understand, the Bible says in Matthew 10, 37, He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And so in the name of Jesus, dear God, 
inject them with courage from above that they may stand for truth. Then use them to win the family that now opposes them. Because with God, all things are possible. And for those still in the valley of decision, dear God, continue your efforts to bring them to the point of surrender to truth, both in this building and online. In Jesus' name I pray, let God's people say, Amen and Amen. Go right up those stairs, I'm coming with you. Somebody lead them right up those stairs, I'm coming with you.